Welcome to Day 2 of PlayerCon, presented by Dapper Labs and NBA Top Shot, where NBA players and their fans link. Next up, Money Trees, a conversation about money moves and fan pitch contests featuring Tobias Harris, Josh Childress, and Hall of Famer Isaiah Thomas, and moderated by NFL player and Rare's founder, Jerome Sapp, and CEO of Camilla Terry Entertainment and venture capitalist, Chameleonaire. This conversation is presented by Rares, the first of its kind investment app for sneakers. You love sneakers. You love the culture around them. Grails, classics, hype drops, collabs, band, limited editions, and shoonicorns. The ones you've only heard about, but never actually seen. You hear these kicks will probably be worth a lot more in the future. You think you could make some money if you could ever get your hands on them. But wait in a line. I'm good, thanks. Take an L to a bot? I'll pass. Snatching them up online? You get priced out as soon as they drop. Meet Rares, a game-changing, first-of-its-kind social investing app that lets anyone invest in sneakers. Buy and trade shares in any of the shoes on our platform and interact with other like-minded users on our social feed. All of our offerings are SEC qualified. You know, the same suits who regulate the stock market. We buy the shoes, you buy the shares. Sell the shares as the value of the shoe changes, or hold on to them until we sell the shoe. Reds, stop watching from the sidelines. Invest in the culture. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to PlayerCon. This is Money Trees, brought to you by the MBPA, Rares, Dapper Labs, where we discuss off the court money moves with the players. I am yours truly, Chameleon. I'll start by introducing myself, if you don't mind, Jerome. Um, there you go. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Chameleon Air is my name. I'm a former entrepreneur in residence at one of the largest venture capital firms in Southern California. That's where I learned a little bit about the art of investing. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a CEO and founder of a social video company called Combos, which focuses on face to face communication with. Uh, interesting people. Uh, you can download that in the app store right now. Um, I'm also a musician. I know a lot of people know me as a musician, that guy that made that song Riding Dirty. But <laughs> I'm going to be honest, I started with the other stuff first because I always felt like I was an entrepreneur in a rapper's frame, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I've always been an entrepreneurial person. Um, I've invested in a lot of companies, probably 60 plus companies right now. I invest in early stage startups starting with Seed and Series A. I do that alongside a bunch of other athletes, celebrities, and entertainers. And hopefully we can get to some of these money moves. You know, Jerome, you ready to tell the people about yourself? Yeah, man, well, I appreciate you uh, giving a little background to the viewers. My name is Jerome Sapp. I'm the founder and CEO of Rares, uh, which is essentially the, the world's first SEC regulated market that allowed you to invest in your favorite sneakers. I'm also a five-year NFL veteran. I played in the NFL for five, six years. And also was a former uh, Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame captain and All-American. And lastly, I got my, my MBA at Harvard Business School. But after all that said and done, I'm just a kid from Houston, Texas. I grew up in the Fifth Ward. Um, I came from nothing. And, you know, I wanted to make a difference in this world. And, you know, luckily I have a, a, an amazing team around me uh, that's, uh, that's allowed me to, to, to start doing that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. We both got that common bond being from Houston. So Houston yep. has bred some real entrepreneurs, if y'all can't tell. Um, yeah, man. It's all man. In the age. <laughs> yeah, so I want to get straight to it. I want to start bringing the players up. We've got a great group of players that are going to come up here and talk about money moves. You know, a lot of things the players are doing off the court to kind of take themselves to the next level. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of people that you've been watching on TV forever. Uh, I know a lot of fans are watching in the chat, so I encourage y'all to make sure that y'all keep the dialogue going. You know, post your questions. Hey, what's up, fellas? How y'all doing? We are good. What's going on? We're great. Uh, How you well? All right, all right. I, 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 was always, I was never good at dunking, but I was always good at throwing alley oops. So I'm gonna try to get the intros on right. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna start off with Josh. Josh Childress from Harbor City, California. Played for Stanford in college. Was first team All Pac-10, where he was able to accomplish being Pac-10 Player of the Year. Sixth overall pick in the NBA draft by the Atlanta Hawks, but went on to play in New Jersey for the Nets, Phoenix Suns, New Orleans Pelicans. The simple way to say it is he got buckets for every squad that he played for. Uh, successful international career also, Greek League All-Star, Greek League top scorer, 
NBL scoring champion, all NBL first team, probably has more passport stamps than all of us. Um, and now Josh focuses on real estate and investments and social impact. He's the CEO of Landspire Group, which is a Los Angeles based real estate and investment fund that revitalizes communities of color alongside a bunch of other philanthropic things. Welcome, Josh Childress, to Player Con. What's up, man? What's up? I appreciate y'all having me. Thanks for the, the, the gracious introduction. Uh, you made me sound really good, so thank you. <laughs> All right, here's truth. They're going to know it in a second. We're going to show them. We're going to show them. All right. All right, so next up, we got Tobias Harris out of Islip, New York. Shout out to everybody from Long Island. Uh, he's been getting busy since he was a youngin in high school. He was crowned Mr. New York basketball. He was the first team parade All-American and a McDonald's All-American. He went on to Tennessee for one year to play college ball, but he quickly showed that he was ready for the big leagues. He was drafted in the first round by the Charlotte Bobcats and went on to play for the Milwaukee Bucks and got buckets for them. Also played for the Orlando Magics and the Detroit Pistons, got buckets. Los Angeles Clippers and now Philadelphia 76ers where he continues to get buckets. It's not easy playing as long in the NBA as Tobias, but you know you can pretty much call him an OG veteran in the NBA. He's active in helping the communities and the kids in each of the cities that he's played for, player, philanthropist, and businessman. Tobias, welcome to PlayerCon, man. I appreciate it. It's, it's an honor to be up here with some inspiring brothers, so I'm excited for this. Let's get it. Yeah, you called me out before we got up here, so I'm going to show you the energy in a second. <laughs> All right, yeah, we let's go. do it. <laughs> all right, all right. So last but not least, we got the OG Isaiah Thomas, Chicago, aka Shy Town's own. You know you gotta be tough to coming out of Chicago. He played during the bad boy era. I'm talking about the time when a foul was a real foul. They used yeah. to clothesline you and the refs wouldn't think twice about it. You know, he was drafted <laughs> second in the NBA draft by the Detroit Pistons and went on to play for them his whole career. Uh he was an NBA assist leader, 12-time NBA All-Star, three-time all NBA first team two-time NBA champion. He led the Pistons to consecutive championships, NBA Finals MVP, even won a gold medal for Team USA, a legendary Hall of Famer, amazing businessman, entrepreneur, and wine connoisseur. Welcome, Isaiah Thomas, to PlayerCon. Hey, thank you, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for that introduction. And, and Josh, I miss you with the fro, man. Couldn't <laughs> 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 well. Yeah, I got to throw this little thought in there real quick, though, Isaiah, because, you know, when I was uh, coming up, I'm, I'm, I'm big on your era. You know, that's 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 where, where I was raised watching basketball. And it was something about the toughness of these players that I don't know exists today. No disrespect to any other players, but I remember people used to get fouled like crazy. And I watched you make all the five, 11 guys like me feel like we had a shot of making it to the NBA, man. man. Well, well, thank you. And, and no, those. You know, times were different then. People played hard. You know, people played tough. Uh, the rules were different, uh, which allowed you to play that way. And, you know, back then it was a big man's game. And uh, everything was centered around the big man. And, uh, you know, those of us who played on the perimeter like you and I, uh, you know, whenever we went into the lane, you know, it was hell to pay for it. Uh, but but now the it's more of a perimeter game and uh, it's not a big man's game anymore. So therefore you don't have as many hard fouls as you used to have back then because the, the big man could really lay wood on you and they did. Mm. All right, you wanna take it away? Yeah, yeah. Isaiah, you, you sound like you talking about the NFL right now, man, laying wood. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I said this the other day, I said, you know, if, if Jerry Rice played in the NFL right now, yeah. how many yards would he rack up now? Because oh, you know, the receivers now, they can go over the middle. They don't get yep. laid out. Ain't no Ronnie yep. Lott down there. <laughs> yeah, man. His, his records would be untouchable if he played right now. Um, and I got a funny story about Jerry Rice. We talked about that uh, another time when he was, I think, 42. He's, he had 228 receiving yards against us at 42 years old. So that was crazy. But, yeah, we can move into the next conversation. Um, and first of all, Isaiah. I want to I want to congratulate you on your Shoreline Champagne and the national distribution rollout. I believe you can find your Champagne in, in Target, Walmart, and also Sam Club. Correct? That that is correct. Yes. And okay, uh, yeah. Thank you. yeah, congratulations on that. Well, the first question we're going to get into is investment trends. You know, I think all of us are familiar with investments and all obviously trends, whether it's a fashion trend, investment trend, but. How do you guys evaluate all the trends that come before you to evaluate to invest in? How do you how do you decipher which ones is just a fad or trend or 
something that you really need to pay attention to. Anybody can take that one. Yeah, that's for anyone. Okay, I'll, I'll start. I say um, the best way to evaluate, I mean, obviously, what <clears throat> a lot of things that come across the desk is, you know, you're putting your trust in the person who first started the company, right? And that's always one of the main things that I look at is if I sit down and I talk with somebody, I have to know that this person is actually going to be doing the due diligence and is going to be putting 100% effort into whatever the business is. Uh, and then there obviously is a lot of trends. So, you know, there's things that, that you see out there that have a lot of the hype train to it that a lot of people get involved in without actually looking at the infrastructure or really diving into understanding what it's about. Um, and I, I fell victim to that a little bit in some different different things. But as I learned, I said, okay, if I'm gonna get into something, I have to be, I have to be knowledgeable on the subject of what it is. And it's either gotta be a passion for me or it's gotta be something that I say, I think this can last long term. So, you know, number one is the person operating. That's always a huge, huge thing and the person has to be motivated they have to be uh same way that you know a team invest in players is the same way that you would be investing in a business and that person has to work their tail off to get the business up and going got you yeah well uh, you 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 mentioned a, a key word in there due diligence how do you guys go about your due diligence when you're evaluating the deal and also too with the investment space you can be too late sometimes so you due diligence can't take forever so how do you guys balance being being thorough with your due diligence but not being too late over a deal so i, I i'll just jump in and, and, and josh you can you can cut me off when you want to or just you know dovetail uh after me um you know in terms of myself uh my, my business experience and my knowledge is uh startups and turnarounds those are mm -hmm. the two markets that i play in so uh from an investment standpoint um I'm an owner operator. Um, most of my companies that you see in my portfolio are startups. Um, and, you know, being a startup company, you, you, you know, you're everything from the president to the janitor. So you, yeah. you, you know, so that the investment is really in, in yourself and your belief and, and also uh, what you're interested in. Um, you sure. know, I try to pick things that I, um, uh, I have some interest in, some knowledge about and also uh, some passion with it because there are going to be some days that, you know, it, it's not working out for you. So when mm -hmm. I got into Sherlon Champagne right now, <clears throat> I'm the largest uh, black owned champagne company in the world uh, wow. and have the, I'm the largest, also highest producer of first press of the grape champagne in the world. Most of wow. the champagne that everybody gets that you, you go in the stores and you buy, they're all, you know, second press or third press. Uh, but we're the highest volume producer of first press grape champagne that's in the world. So uh, mm -hmm. that takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of due diligence, but it's also mm -hmm. something you have to be passionate about and, and work at it every day. True. True. Yeah, Josh, that, 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 yeah. So, you know, all of us on this stage have been blessed to, you know, have great networks, right? And so, um, you know, part of that due diligence is, is leveraging that network. Uh, you know, you, you got to know who to call uh, regarding what industry and what product type. Uh, and that's really, you know, the extent of, of my initial due diligence, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the market. So I know if it's something, you know, involved in tech, I'm going to call, you know, community there. Or if it's something in real estate, I have mentors there. Uh, but, you know, leveraging the network that I've been able to build over a number of years, uh, you know, is critical. And then obviously, you know, as Isaiah mentioned, uh, is it something that I'm interested in? You know, is it something sure. that, that speaks to me outside of, you know, potentially making a dollar, uh, because if I'm not truly interested in it, then I'm not going to, you know, really proceed with the diligence as, as I, I would with something that, you know, I have true interest in. And so um, those are the, the, the main things that I would say, uh, you know, I look at, uh, you know, as it relates to diligence. I wonder how much the opportunity matters to you. Uh, for example, you know, when I first uh, invested, I invested in a self-driving car company. I don't know anything about self-driving cars, right? But I was able to talk to the founder and understand how big this business potentially could be. Well, I felt like they were the right team for it. And the company ended up going on to get acquired by General Motors for a lot of money. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of times when you're trying to figure this stuff out, trying to figure out what to invest in, venture capitalists and investors often think that they know it all. Right. So how much of your domain expertise weighs on your decision 
And, you know, is there some other thing that you can lean on when you don't have the understanding of exactly the type of company that somebody's about to build? Or do you just avoid not investing in that period because you don't have domain expertise? You know, you know for me, I, I've always, uh, again, I, I always try to participate in things that I knew about. Um, and coming out of uh, the NBA, you know, some of my first acquisitions were around sports and entertainment. I'm the co-founder of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, I started the Toronto Raptors in Toronto, uh, still the only international team that exists outside of the United States. I was able to go into that only because I knew the business of basketball and I knew what I was getting into. Uh, I had a popcorn company called Indiana Popcorn. So that why because I like popcorn. So, yeah. you know, I, I very rarely do I go into spaces that uh, I have little understanding of or not passionate about. And fortunately enough for, for us as, um, you know, I'm a former athlete and we got current athletes. Fortunately enough for us, you know, you've, you've made enough money where you can be patient. And I'm okay with, with missing a deal and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I have to get involved with every one of them. And if I miss one sure. of them, I'm, I'm good with that. I, I still got the money in my pocket, so I'm all right. <laughs> I like that. Well, those are, take, those uh, are oh, go ahead. I take a little, uh, a little bit of a different approach. So I, I look at it in terms of, though, like number one for me is to invest in something that I, I do have a passion with, but if something adds up with the deal flow and um, the return on it, I look into that, even if I don't exactly know too much of the business. And you know what Josh alluded to is that's where I lean on kind of the people that I know, advisors and, People that, you know, me personally, I, I'm not there yet to be able to look through a whole deal flow book or, or look through, you know, all the numbers and everything that a business has and say, okay, this makes sense. So that's why I would lean on an advisor, somebody who's in that space that does it. And if they come back and they say, hey, this seems to be a good, a good business to invest in, then I go and I say, okay, well, if I like the team that's running it, and I think they're a team that's like hardworking and can get a job done, then I look and say, okay, maybe this is something that I'll, I'll invest in. So I kind of take that approach to it. But if, if it makes sense to my portfolio and it's something that I believe in, because when you invest in these companies, you it's a true, a full on belief that you have to have in the group mm -hmm. of who's doing it. And um, that's how, that's how I, I really go about a lot of the deals. Got you. Well, that, that's a lot of great insight. Well, let's, let's uh, switch gears real quick. Let's get into equity moves. You know, as, as athletes and entertainers, you know, we have a short window to make the money we're making. Um, Isaiah, you know, a lot of people aren't as blessed to play as long as you did um, and have the career you did. Um, I played for six seasons. Um, so we're in a culture of pay me now. I want money for my time. I want money for this deal. But how do we change that mindset and change the culture around that to say, OK, what about equity and take an equity for your time or for your participation and and valuing the long-term wealth you can gain from that. So what do you guys think about equity moves, taking equity for deals? Well, I think this shift has happened really because guys are making a lot more money than they used to. Um, sure. You know, you look, you know, back to when Isaiah played versus, you know, where contracts are now, um, you know, the, the contracts have increased substantially. And so guys can be a little bit more patient with, uh, you know, with a company and taking equity versus taking a check. And so the mindset has shifted. And I will even when I played, and I didn't play that long ago, um, you know, just money wasn't being spoken about in the locker rooms, right? And so sure. everybody talked about, you know, trying to make as much as you could, but, you know, never really about, you know, creating growth, uh, you know, opportunities long term for yourself and your family. And I think that's where, where equity has kind of crept up and been a lot more prevalent. Uh, you know, and that's something that I, I am very much, uh, a, although, you know, you can also have a balance, you know, and getting a, a small, you know, check, but also having some equity on, on the back end. But, you know, it's all about your, your personal preference and, and where you are and what you what you believe in in this company. Um, sure. You know, but I just think those conversations have shifted over time. Got you. I, I would say from, you know, from, from myself, um, you know, I, I started out early in my career on the endorsement track. Um, and I would say the first five, six years, it was about endorsements. And then I quickly switched to equity. Um, you know, if you look at the last, you know, six, seven years of my career, 
uh, I really became an owner uh, entrepreneur uh, within that space. And in my first uh, you know, acquisition uh, actually was in '92. I was on the cover of Forbes magazine, um, and a lot of you, y'all probably weren't even born. Uh, but in '92, I, I, I rolled up American Speedy Printing. Uh, 700 quick print chains across the United States. Ended up selling that. Uh, was in, and then you know I I continued to play in the equity space. And, and again, when you look at my portfolio, I own all my companies. Um, so I, as an investor, uh, again, it it has always been about uh, ownership, uh, controlling, and and really uh, you know making your own path. Um, you know, betting on yourself uh, as an owner operator. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you you know what's going in and what's going out, how much you're spending, and and then being able to operate in the international space has given me a totally different look and view of the world than just uh, operating in the in the space of America. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I think we'll um actually Camille, you know, I, I think we'll get into actually my company Rares now and talk yeah. about alternative Video. asset investment. We yeah. got a video we got to play on you because we can't let you sit up here and not talk about your company real quick. <laughs> well, actually, actually, we may have already seen the video, so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead, man. Tell us about the company, man. Well, the company rares, man. You know, I'm fortunate. You know, I, I was able to mix two passions, sneakers and finance. You know, as I mentioned, I grew up in Houston, Texas, in the Fifth Ward, and, you know, I couldn't afford sneakers back then, but we always looked up to the guys who could who could afford and who can wear Jordans and and even Michael Jordan and and really all the sneakers the NBA players were wearing. So I was fortunate enough to to get a scholarship to University of Notre Dame, and I was a finance major there, and and really you know was fortunate enough to get drafted. And you know in between the off seasons of my NFL career, I got my MBA at Harvard, and that's where the concept of Reg really began because we started learning about alternative assets and all the different things you can do with alternative assets. And to me, alternative assets simply meant hobbies. And I was a sneakerhead at the time. And I was like, man, what if you can turn this sneaker into a security that people can invest in, just like a stock, just like a company? Um, at the time, I realized sneakers were an appreciating asset and the secondary market was starting to evaluate them that way. You know, the sneaker industry is a $79 billion a year industry. But there's also pockets of that industry that only want to flip the shoe to make money, meaning they buy the shoe low, then they sell it high. So when we come in, we say, OK, well, you know, you may not have access to that shoe you want to flip or you may not be able to afford that sneaker you want to flip. We'll, we'll do that. We'll buy it. We'll get it securitized through the SEC, which is the same governing body that regulates the stock market. And we'll allow you to own fractional shares in these collectible sneakers. Now, we're talking about sneakers that are. $10,000 and higher. You know, our most expensive sneaker is actually $1.8 million. The Kanye West sneaker that, that he wore at the Grammys in 2008. So my idea was, man, all the communities and cultures that made this sneaker industry what it is, that made it valuable, that made it popular, were at some point left out of the, of, of the profit of it from the sneaker industry. So what we're doing is essentially re-gentrifying that market and saying, hey, come back in. We, we made sneaker purchasing and, and investing affordable. So you can invest in a share of a, an expensive collectible sneaker for as little as $15 a share. So when that sneaker appreciates in value, so do the shares you own in that sneaker. The same way it works with any other company you invest in. Um, so we're essentially, you know, creating the world's first true stock market for sneakers, basically. Hey, Jerome, I got to hit you with this question because we all kind of have this in common. We come from industries where people often put you in a box. Y'all heard the term yeah. shut up and dribble. It's probably shut yeah. up and tackle for y'all. For us, it's shut up and make everybody wave their hands side to side on the stage. But often when you get into a different um, arena, people often don't expect you to have the same success as others that went into a traditional route, right? So I've always looked at it like, you know, being a rapper kind of gives you a finger on the pulse of the young generation. So you kind of know what's coming. So yeah. that helped me in my founder journey. So I'm wondering, how do you feel that your uh, career as an athlete has prepared you for being a founder and building a company? You know, Ken, that's a great question, man. And I think I think we can all relate to this. Taking no, taking no, but not taking it personal, though. When someone tells you, no, you're not good enough or you're not this enough or your idea is not baked enough. 
I didn't take it personal because I was used to that in the sports world. And I, I just look within myself and say, okay, well, how do I need to make it better? I didn't take it personal. I use that as, okay, he's giving me some good advice. Also being tenacious, knowing that there, I have a goal and knowing that no one else may see this goal. Um, and as athletes and entertainers, we sometimes go through long spurts of, of darkness where it's just us and our vision, what we want to accomplish. We may be coming back from an injury and no one will ever think we're going to come back from it. You know, we may have fell off the tracks or whatever, but we see it and we see it and we have a, a this this internal passion for it and the ability to say, you know, what, I don't care what you think. I don't care how many no's you've told me over here. I believe in it and I'm going to accomplish that. So being an athlete prepared me for that as an entrepreneur and it's really helped me with this startup rares got it uh, i know that athletes speak a language sometimes that everybody else can't hear they all understand it they all kind of know the lingo so i'm wondering the fellas that are on the stage with us right now the great you know players um are y'all like what questions would you have for a founder like him that's coming from being an athlete that's trying to you know take this journey into being a, a entrepreneur and a tech founder you know I would say, where do you where do you see your company in the next ten years? You know, that's a good question, man. I see my company thriving. You know, or exited. You know, and you know, but the key is, I don't grow this company to be exited. I grow this company to be the most valuable company it could be. And if somewhere along the line it's purchased or exited, then so be it. Um, mm -hmm. Our goal is, or my goal is, to stick to the vision and and scale as we need to with the right timing, with the right partners, and also with the right team. I have an amazing team that also buys into my vision. I mean, I couldn't do this without my team. So in 10 years, I see this company in a good place, whether we're still in charge or someone else purchased it from us and are running it. And my last question for you, Jerome, is a lot of times people on the outside look and see what founders are doing or athletes are doing, and they never really see uh, the, the the real grit that happens. It's always the, the glamorous stuff. So what would you say is your number one job as a founder of a company? Like what what is the day to day like? Yeah, man, that's a good that's another good question. And you know, I'd say and you guys can all relate to this It's sticking to the vision. You know, as a CEO and the founder, it's your vision and you have to make sure the companies are going according to your vision, but not being stubborn enough to say, OK, well, this vision is not necessarily working all the way. Let's pivot to this where we can get more traction also hiring good people around you the number one way you can multiply yourself is to hire smart people so you can essentially be in more places at one time and i've done that with my team you know from marketing to to operations to tech the people you bring on around you are the people that essentially help you make your company successful so to wrap that up you know it's sticking to the vision and leading your company with the vision you have and, and being you know be, not being apologetic about that vision but also hiring the right people to help you multiply yourself and your time. All right. So now i got a question for all the panelists up here. Um, it's not a secret that a lot of people that come from the world that we come from have somewhat of imposter syndrome, right? Because we go out in these places and we see people that don't look like us. We see people that might be learn how to code. They went to Stanford or they went to some school. Uh, no offense to anybody who went to Stanford on the stage. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes you feel like, like a fish out of water. So what would be your advice to the people out there that might want to get into the world of investing? They might not have a jump shot like LeBron. They might not be able to tackle people and run fast, but they, 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 they know how to use their mind. What would be your advice to that person that's looking to get into investing or building a company? Uh, you know, anybody can take this one. Uh I say, you know, just be tenacious and be coachable. One of the biggest things Jerome mentioned was just, you know, don't take it personal. And I just took that as being coachable. You know, you have people around you that, you know, are just as smart or smarter than you, uh, that may be giving you feedback or advice. Uh, you know, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. And how can you disseminate that knowledge, you know, to, to essentially move your vision forward? So always be tenacious in what you do and, and you know, be one track minded with your vision, but be coachable in that as well. I, I would I would I would go back to to the basics in terms of, um, <clears throat> you know, everybody, you know, has has their dollars that they've earned or, you know, you know, that you want to keep and you want to hold on to and you want to be safe with it. And, and the best way to be safe with it is to really, truly learn and understand what it is that you're investing in 
uh, mm -hmm. because when you are an investor, you are you are basically uh, placing your trust and belief in someone else, and mm -hmm. and so you get ready to take your hard-earned dollars out of your pocket and put it in somebody else's hands and say, mm -hmm. I believe in your vision. Uh, mm -hmm. And and if you're going to believe in somebody else's vision, you're going to believe in somebody else's expertise. Then take the time to really understand and find out what it is that you're investing in, who you're investing in, and, and then you can decide if you want to put your dollars in this person's hands to trust him or her with your money. Because, you know, when you're talking about investing, that's really what you're doing. You're taking money out of your pocket and you're giving mm -hmm. it to somebody else and you're betting on that person's vision, not yours. Absolutely. My advice, uh, my advice would be just to have a goal. Like, you know, I think it's it's simple to be said, but it's a true statement. Like, figure out what you want to make outside of what you make from either a job or your own business, right? Like, what type of percentage do you want back? Do you want? Are you okay with making five to seven percent year after year? Can that fit your lifestyle? So, first, figuring out the lifestyle that you want to have. And figuring out ways to make that percentage, make that percentage through um, alternative investments. And if you're somebody who aspires to make 50% of, of your income every single year, you're going to take a higher risk right then and there. So, you know, you have mm -hmm. to be willing to take a loss as well. But figure out, have a goal and figure out your lifestyle, what you want and what you want to make. It, either it can be in stocks, it could be in, um, you know, cryptocurrency, it could be in, uh, you know, private equity, venture capital, whichever one, but I'm about diversification, but I would say, have a goal, have a goal in mind of a percentage that you want to make and shoot for it and try to make it every single year. Man, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that game, man. We appreciate y'all. Y'all have yeah. given some real good game to these people. I hope everybody was listening, taking that to heart. Yeah. Um, we appreciate y'all. We got some founders now that are about to come up here and get put on the hot seat since we're talking all this <laughs> and stuff. I want to see yeah. who's going to be able to pitch their company right. So yeah. uh, we're going to get to that first, right, Jerome? Yeah, I'm ready for it, man. It's going to be fun. All right. So, fellas, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. OG, Isaiah, yeah. Thomas. Man, yeah. you don't know, man. Thank yeah. you. I know, man. I didn't yeah. make you a basketball player, but I was luckily I was able to be another type of baller. Well, you, <laughs> you definitely are that. <laughs> thank y'all man thank y'all man appreciate y'all you. appreciate y'all's time and your insight thank you guys wait you know what you know what i'm gonna call it audible can y'all stay up here for the pictures is that okay let's do it y'all ain't got nowhere to be no nah, let's do it all right all right that's great i want y'all to be up here too so we can really have them on the hot seat while they're looking at all of us right now all right so uh first we're gonna bring up kitty credit evan is the founder he's gonna talk about his company and we're gonna see we're gonna see no Simon Cowell, don't worry about it. You know, we're gonna be out here <laughs> being honest with people. And how you doing, man? I'm pretty good, sir. How about yourself? Hey, we're doing good, man. So we want to hear about this company, Kitty Credit. Go ahead and let us know about your business and what you got going on. Sounds good. Um, but first off, as somebody who spent years around the basketball community, uh, good enough to make the first team at LA Fitness, but not enough to be a pro, I decided to take my talents elsewhere. I chose the path to entrepreneurship. However, I didn't have too much access to capital to fund any of my ideas. And when I was trying to get a business loan, there was always something to stop me, my credit score. So I used to really get down on myself about this. And then I realized that it's partly my fault, but it's also something I, I didn't learn about growing up. So it led me on a journey to develop something that teaches about credit before you need it. credit when leveraged properly can be used as a tool to generate wealth. And it's our goal to build a platform that addresses the wealth gap and creates an equitable future for all. Okay. So how do you do it? Well, before I go any further, let me introduce myself. How's it going, everybody? My name is Evan Leapart, and I'm the founder and CEO of Kitty Credit. What is Kitty Credit? It's a chore tracking tool that teaches kids about credit, where the premise of the app is the better a child performs their assigned duties, the better their credit score. So, for example, think of a missed chore like a missed payment, the long you've had a chore like the long you've had a credit card, and anytime a kid says, hey, mom, can I get this? Hey, dad, can I get this? It's like an inquiry. Now, the beta concept has gotten strong buy-in early on. We've had strong support from organizations such as YMCA and Equifax as well. Um, in fact, Equifax President Bev Anderson was recently quoted calling Kitty Credit the one partner that always brings a smile to her face. 
<laughs> now, since the launch of our public beta, we've had over 60,000 chores completed in the app, and we've been featured in outlets like CNBC, Bankrate, now this, and we're called the financial literacy app teaching up kids about credit by Forbes. Now, I know what you all are thinking. Yeah, 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 that's cool and all, but how do you make money? Now, our business model is B2B2C as we work with organizations and municipalities looking to provide additional resources to their intended audience at a rate of $50 per year per family unit. Um, we decided B2B2C instead of B2C because, for one, we wanted to engage with platforms you're familiar with. So having organizational support can help with our rate of adoption, and it also eliminates having to monetize from the audience that needs this product the most but doesn't need to pay monthly for an additional service. So yeah. why would a business pay for this? Uh, let's take YMCA, for example. So they have challenges around parent engagement. The parent who's more involved tends to stay in the program longer, and we can help encourage that by giving them the ability to add tasks to the family unit that drive engagement. So, for example, ask mom to check Google Classroom or ask dad to sign a permission slip. So two examples there, but it, it works for financial institutions as well, especially credit unions and community banks. And why them? Well, 60% of kids whose parents bank at credit unions, they end up banking elsewhere. So our goal is to keep these kids engaged with their ecosystem early. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this pitch. As an avid basketball fan and one who can count NBA legends D. Wade and Baron Davis as early investors and believers in our vision, I feel grateful to share my journey here with the MBPA. Um, programs like this are important to reiterate the need for financial literacy, and it's never too early to give kids a head start. So with you all's help, we promise to do our part to empower credit-healthy families that can trim down the wealth gap in this country. Again, my name's Evan Leapart, and this is Kitty Credit. Evan, Great. that was awesome. That was that was really awesome. I mean, you hit it on all the points. Um, you know, congratulations to you. I mean, that's you've come a long way. You got traction, and um, it's going to give us something to think about in the deliberation. So, great job, man. Thank you. All right. So, um, I think we'll move forward now and bring up another founder that's going to do another awesome pitch. Hey, I like that kitty credit. That that was cool. I don't want to get that. Right Evan's ready for Shark Tank, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Evan's ready for Shark Tank. Right, you know? uh, fan number two, uh, um, founder number two is Scott from Get Ketsy. How you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Hey, man. You're trying yeah. to be like you, man. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's an honor to, to be a part of this event. And uh, hello to all the panelists. My name is Scott Graham. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kexi. Uh, and without further ado, I'll, I'll just go ahead and get started, okay? Sure. The total addressable market for the US food and beverage industry is almost $900 billion. At the core of this market, millions of transactions take place between buyers and sellers every day. With this in mind, I built Kexi, a unique multi-sided platform that redefines the way buyers and sellers conduct business. After playing college basketball at Fresno State for the legendary coach Jerry Tarkanian, I entered the hospitality industry. Having worked for many restaurants and bars over the years, I grew tired of seeing the same challenges and archaic processes being used. Pen and paper to conduct inventory, waste that is not appropriately tracked, theft of products from staff members. The list goes on and on. And while restaurants struggle with those issues, distribution companies face their own set of problems. Sales reps are spread thin trying to compete for shelf space while servicing a multitude of accounts. A lack of understanding customer needs often leads to missed sales opportunities. Kexi has made their problems our mission. By analyzing buying behavior and inventory patterns, Retailers can see an 85% increase in efficiency when using Kexi, resulting in an average savings of $50,000 a year. And with the data that Kexi acquires, distributors are notified who is ready to buy when buying windows are open, putting them in the right place at the right time every time. Mm -hmm. While the hospitality industry experienced one of its worst years ever, here at Kexi, we have expanded to over 20 countries and quadrupled our restaurant customer base during the same time period. This growth can be attributed to a universal change in mindset. Retailers are looking for affordable technologies to help offset their losses, and distributors are exploring cost-effective ways to service more customers. 
you're probably wondering how your investment will be spent. We are currently raising a seed round of $1 million to grow our software development team, enhance the overall user experience, and expand our sales and marketing efforts. We will also explore other opportunities in similar vertical markets, such as the cannabis industry. Our service attainable market is $241 billion. That number represents all of the products that distributors sold to bars, restaurants, and liquor stores in 2019. While it has become very popular to invest in a vodka or a tequila startup, what I am offering to you is a much more lucrative opportunity to control the entire marketplace. With your help, we aim to make Kexi the next success story. Join us and thank you. Man, they got these pitches down, man. I yeah, like man, that. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's a great again, name, too. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, being a former athlete, that's that that helps too. You know, seeing you jump into that entrepreneurial journey, that's that's awesome, man. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess one quick question, and then um, what, what was the first? What, what was the first thing that made you think of starting this company? What was the first um, thing that made you say, "I can disrupt this market"? Let me create. Man, it. thank you for asking that question. It happened one night when I was bartending, and my manager had told me last minute I had the bar all cleaned and everything. And last minute, his name's Chuck. I'm calling him out. If Chuck, if you're watching, man, he's cold. <laughs> but, but he said, Scott, I forgot to tell you, we have to do uh, we have to do inventory tonight. And I was like, man, I was almost ready to go home. And now I ended up having to be there for three, four hours, counting bottles, taking. To, I just knew it was there was a better way, a faster way. So instead of doing it in hours, we reduced it down to doing it in minutes with our technology. And then lastly, I'll just state. Um, on the, on the distributor side, everyone would come in, the reps, trying to sell me different products, but they had no knowledge. They would just come in and say, hey, you need anything? And I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. You're trying to sell me. Yeah. And yeah. one particular instance, I bought uh, five cases for our restaurant uh, of a particular Chardonnay. The next yeah. day, a, a sales rep came in trying to, trying to pitch me or sell me three different types of Chardonnay. And had they had the knowledge of knowing what I really needed, which was Cabernet, they would have been prepared. Mm -hmm. So that right. was sort of the aha moment where I can do, we can do this better. Got you, got you. That's, that's cool. Yep. Thank you. We yeah. kind of cheated a little bit. We asked him questions and we didn't ask the person before, but it's all good. Put him back on, put him back on. <laughs> no, no, no. It was all, it was all good, man. Thank you though. Uh, that was a good pitch. And uh, now- Yeah, thanks ready. Scott. Appreciate it, man. All right, so next up we got Jeremy with Trainer Sports. He's gonna come up and tell us a little bit about his company. And uh, yeah, we're gonna keep it moving. It's going pretty good with these guys, man. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, what's going on, guys? Yeah, hey, good, cool. man. I know I recognize you, so that's, I'm just disclose that right now. I don't know why, <laughs> but I just I've seen you before. But yeah, I, I pitched. I pitched on. Uh, I, I pitched on combos. Oh, so you pitched in my app? See, look, yeah, look. The, the company that I pitched. Man, see how I remember that? Yeah, we actually saw that company. So uh, wow, wow. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, man. Tell us about your company. All right. So uh, first of all, the, the pandemic, right? Like, I don't really need to say much after that, but I will. Um, when the pandemic hit last year, uh, it robbed, like literally robbed almost 8 million high school and collegiate athletes from being able to compete to go to the next level in their sports career. Um, equally, more than 300,000 uh, uh, training facilities and individual trainers uh, were forced uh, away from their athletes, they had to take, uh, those individual trainers had to take on odd jobs, and some of them even had to close their doors permanently. Um, I'm Jeremy Gaston, CEO and co-founder of Trainer Sports, where we're building a dual marketplace and ecosystem where athletes gain inexpensive virtual or physical access to high level trainers, and where trainers gain scalable access to more athletes across the globe. Um, how it works is this, using the Trainer Plus app uh, for only $50 a month, trainers record individual drills and create custom workouts uh, for athletes to, to access. Uh, then using the Trainer app, uh, athletes are then able to complete drills uh, from their favorite trainers for free. Um, and for only $25 a month, they can access and com complete um, workouts customized exactly for them. Um, by building out 
their catalog, our trainers are able to um, increase their value, but also um, earn money and train in their sleep, which is unheard of, right? So while 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 equally our our athletes are um, are able to level up and compete against their peers uh, who have trainers as well because now they have access to trainers in their pocket. Um, with a team made up of former pros and semi-pro athletes, basketball players, um, we're taking the digital transformation uh, and sports training to the next level. Uh, we're currently seeking 500 k um, at a $5 million valuation um, and looking to, to grow our, our engineering team uh, and be able to get to scale at a speedy rate. So thank you guys for listening. You know, that was awesome, man. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like a Peloton Plus app, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, but but better. So congratulations on that. Plus also like, I like your, your, your uh, name mark too. Whoever your designer is did an awesome job on that. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the designer and a developer. Oh, okay. okay. That's what's up. Okay. That's yeah. what's up. You gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. I love it. You got to in order to get out the door. All right. So, so, so are you so I guess one question, are you guys using a like a that uh, like a Facebook live streaming the technology? Okay. No, custom built. Uh so the framework is very similar to to TikTok. So we looked at it and we saw that a lot of trainers were taking their taking their training sessions virtual using TikTok and using Zoom. So yep. already understanding that this is what athletes are getting used to. They're getting used to submitting a video of themselves doing a workout, getting feedback from pro level trainers or pro level athletes uh, for a couple bucks here and there. Um, we decided to give them something that would minimize friction. Um, so they're already using those tools. So let's build a tool that's similar, but not having to rest on a third party system. So if they gotcha. pull access, then our whole business is floored. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Man, it's going to be tough, man. That. It's going to be tough, man. We got to do some deliberating, all of us, to figure out which one of the three founders gave the best pitch. I ain't going to lie. This is went a little bit better than I thought it was going to be. No disrespect. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I got to in the MVPA and who they curate, but, you know, this, this is pretty awesome, man. So uh, thank you for your time. We are going to go into the green room and try to figure out. I'm going to make these guys who haven't been doing as much talking while the founders are talking, give me their opinions, too. We are going to figure out who is going to be the winner of this pitch competition. And, uh, yeah, let's let's do it. All right, man. That was really, really tough. We almost came to yeah. blow stage. I don't know. We, we, there's some disagreements. I'm not gonna tell y'all who the Simon Cowell was. Yeah, I'm man. But I want to say, man, shout out to those founders. I know it's tough to get up here and pitch in front of people, especially when you got an audience of people watching and you got people that you might look up to that you know that that, that are celebrities. And um, I just think that, you know, it's good to see this type of excellence. You know, uh, it's not tough building a company. I mean, it's not hard to start, but a lot of people never take the step to join and, and to start a company. So congrats to y'all for even taking a step. Um, we're going to announce the winner right now. And this winner on behalf of PlayerCon, NBPA, uh, Rares, is about to win $5,000, right, Jerome? That, that's correct. Yep. Woo! Who's all, gonna be, Kim? All of us are hesitating to say who it is, right? <laughs> I'll say who it is. I ain't scared. I ain't scared. All right. So listen, I just want to say, all the founders did great. Um, what I love about the founders was, you know, your confidence in articulating your thoughts and your companies. We feel like all of them have big opportunities that could potentially be big. Um, we feel like, you know, you you knew your stuff. I wish we had a little bit more time to ask questions, but we didn't, unfortunately. Um, and the, without further ado. The winner of the pitch competition is K. 
Kitty Credit. <laughs> Evan from Kitty Credit. We're gonna do the home. Congrats, congrats. Let's bring him up here so we can talk to him. Thank you, thank Thanks. you, thank you. I know congrats. you were nervous. Man. I know you were nervous because we didn't ask you no questions, right? Bro, I was like, I was like, I, I thought I had five minutes of questioning. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you know sometimes when it's live, you gotta just you know. It's all good. It's all good, man. Thank you so much. Um, so so tell everybody your thoughts about you know just where you're headed with this company and you know the sky's the limit for you. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, man. Right now we're in a stage where we launched it. We have families that are using it, and it's like, how do we take this to the next level? You know, like we started it for kids ages four to twelve, but we realized like kids are gonna turn thirteen, they're gonna turn turn fourteen. Like, what can we do with that? Um, now that we have this partnership with Equifax, like we're going to start doing things where we're actually teaching the parents too. So from a product side, we're focused on three components. It's first, we want to add additional rewards for kids, right? It's, it all starts with the kids. We can get the, the kids engaged in your rewards. So not just money, because only 40% of parents pay allowance. But if we can get these kids to like through product partnerships, get tangible rewards for parents that may not be able to afford gifts for their kids, or just have the ability to facilitate some non-monetary rewards as well. That's step one for us. Um, step two for us is now that they like the rewards, they say, okay, I get these rewards weekly. How can I get them quicker? That's where the educational content comes in. So we've built uh, about 120 hours of educational content that's split up between the four to seven age bracket to eight to 12. So they'll go through these like Duolingo like learning loops. And then at the end of that lesson, now they got bamboo bucks that are getting them step closer to their goal instead of having to wait weekly for that allowance. So they're saying, okay, you want to get something quicker, you got to learn. Right. So it's, it's kind of a give and take. That's typically what works with kids. And then secondly yeah. and thirdly, if those two things are working, then we can say, OK, on the parent side, how do we get them engaged? So then parents start sharing with parents. So that's the yeah. like that's the three things that we're really focused on right now as a product. That's awesome. Gotcha. And hearing you talk a little bit, it kind of makes me think of something I was mentioning to these guys backstage is, you know, I think as a founder, it's very tough to kind of articulate your vision. But it seems to be that you kind of have a very under a clear understanding of your company and you're kind of just spitting it off the head really easily yeah. you know so that's mm -hmm. the one thing that i i think kind of edged you out uh, from the other uh you know contestants um i just think that like that's very important when you're pitching because as somebody like me that sits in front of people all the time just being able yeah. to have confidence and articulate your vision really really clearly the why and why would anybody ever use this app like when you can get that across in a short amount of time then it makes uh everything possible for you you know Thank you, yeah, yeah. You. you know, that, that's exactly right, Cam. And I first want to say thank you to Scott and, and Jeremy for their pitches. As we all agree, all of those companies were, are, are going to be successful. They all did a great job. But but as Cam mentioned, you you had the edge. You knew your business. You knew the model. You knew the market. And I think you did a great job of articulating. But one thing I want to ask you, Evan, actually two things. What has been the hardest part about starting this business? And what is your your your, your number one goal in the future? short-term goal yep i mean when i was when i started i was super naive like i was like oh like we're gonna build this app and then like everybody uses it and i, I thought we were like like that was it and then i launched i was like oh like where's the business behind it so um making that pivot from b to c to b to b to c was big for us because it was like man if you're really trying to like who needs to learn about credit the most it's the parents that shouldn't be paying 4.99 a month for anything else right so like how do you actually build a viable business model if that's your audience and that was where we started to shift towards the B2B to C component. Um, I think that and then just the journey of fundraising too, right? Like we like we've really, really been at it for a year, but I found it in 2018. So I would say just like learning about like fundraising and just going through this whole journey as a non-technical founder um, has has been it, it's just every day is like learning. So, I mean, fortunately, I have great advisors, mentors, great team members around me that are like all smarter than me. So it makes it easier. And then in terms of like a short term goal for us, um, we want to just secure some additional partnerships. You know, so we're super fortunate to have the relationships that we do with Equifax and YMCA, but we're not stopping there. Um, we're we're going in, in actually four days now to start an accelerator program for 12 weeks. So just kind of head down and bring that forward to that time. Um, so it, from a short-term goal and then from a long-term goal, like we, 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 we see like this being the beginning from like credit education standpoint. I feel that we, if we can get to a point where we're actually issuing financial products based off of a, a knowledge-based process, you know, to be a lawyer, you got to pass a bar. So it's like, why not demonstrate what you've learned before you get access to a credit card that could 
either help your future or ruin it. So. Got you. Man. Hey, well, that was awesome. Man. Oh, go ahead. Last Cam. question is, what are you raising? Uh, we're raising right now, raising 1.5. Uh, and uh, we have half of it uh, accounted for. We're raising on a safe and um, candidly, man, I don't know how this works. I think like when you're doing like a pitch, you can't like fully explain what it is. So I, I, I have my- I mean, We're gonna talk after this. Okay. I'm talking to everybody that was on the stage. I want the other guys that's watching, holla at me. Y'all know I invest. So I wanna talk to everybody. So, um, <laughs> but yes, we're, we're still raising. The yes. winner right now. Everybody give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you, thank you, man. That was awesome. And uh, now, man, we got to wrap this thing up. You know, uh, they yeah, produce yeah. the streaming all in our ear. Uh, fellas, <laughs> any last words y'all have, players on the stage, for everybody out there listening? Uh, I, I would just say to, to, to everyone, you know, again, uh, hold on to your dreams and, and be able to, you know, articulate your, your concepts and your, and your space in, in a very short period of time, as we just saw uh, the winner do here in terms of kitty credit. Um, you know, it's easy to understand, uh, it's applicable, and um, everyone gets it right away. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Evan. You know, I'll say, I'll say the big thing, guys, is don't be afraid to take the first step. You know, you know, uh, the first step is what you need to get to two, three, four, five. And once you take that first step, you're going to learn how to best take step three or two and three and four. Um, so I also want to thank all of the, the sponsors, Dapper Labs, Top Shop. I hate that we didn't get into NFT rares. I hate we didn't get into NFTs, non-fungible tokens. You know, that's hot right now. And, you know, Dapper Labs and Top Shop, they're doing an amazing job in that industry. Um, also with rares, if you use co promo code MBA, I'm sorry, MBPA 2.20, you get a $20 credit in your, your account um, to invest in sneakers. Can so you? That's, uh, can you can you say that one more time and just say it a little slower so everybody can hear? Mm. Absolutely. Um, if you go to rares.io um, and use the code MBPA220, um, you get $20 credit in your wallet to invest um, in any of the sneakers we have available on our platform. That's a real veteran move, Isaiah. I like that. <laughs> right. appreciate, appreciate that, Isaiah. That's funny. Yeah. That's a dime that I just dropped. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, so thank you all. Um, we getting the, you know, the producers are telling us to wrap. I thank you for everybody participating. I want y'all to follow y'all's dreams. I want y'all to remember that this investing stuff is planting a seed in your backyard. Eventually, that seed grows into a tree, and the next thing you know, you got apples and oranges and all kind of stuff to feed your family. So, you know, go out there, get informed get relationships and let's get it appreciate y'all thank you guys Cualquiera